Hello, everyone. This is Dory Clark, and we are here with our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better, where we speak with authors, entrepreneurs, and other thinkers about the, the topics that can improve your quality of life. And our guest this week is John Strzelecki. John is a best-selling author. His books have sold more than 8 million copies. One of them is called The Cafe on the Edge of the World. Another that we're going to talk about is called The Big Five for Life. And we're going to talk with John about how to find meaning in your work and in your life. John Strzelecki, welcome. Thank you so much, Dory. Great to see you. Really great to be here. And welcome to everyone who's tuning in from around the world. Please feel free to type into the chat box and let us know who you are and where you are dialing in from. Now, John, a question that I have just to start this all off. One of the main themes in your book, you know, your books and in your life is that now, you know, a number of years ago, you, you were living a fairly traditional life with a fairly traditional job and you gave it all up to go travel and to have adventures. Uh, can you, I think a lot of us might say, hmm, that sounds like not a bad <laughs> idea. Can you talk to us a little bit about what sparked that realization and why, why you decided to do it and how it was actually possible? Because I think a lot of people would be like, well, that sounds nice for John, but I'm never going to yeah. do that. So give right. us the 411. How did you pull this off? Uh, yeah, so I had been an adventurer at heart since I was a little kid and always wanted to see the world, but the, the path to actually doing that was not something that was incredibly clear to me. Uh, but I was in my early 30s. I was on a very fast trajectory uh, in a consulting firm. Uh, my expertise was helping companies be more successful, and I would be flown around the country and show up on a Monday morning and add value in the ways that I possibly could to the board of directors. Uh, it was good work. I was treated well by the company that I was employed with. I found it interesting, but it wasn't exactly like the super big heart connection. Uh, and so I was in my early 30s and I was looking at the people that were 10 years older than me. And I asked myself kind of the tough question, Dory, which is if I keep going the way that I'm going in 10 years, who will I be? And, and basically, I was looking at the people 10 years older than me and thinking, I'm going to be them, right? And same company, same type of job, different maybe role and responsibility, but that's who I'll be. Not that there was anything wrong with those people or anything wrong with the job they were doing, but I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be that guy 10 years later. And so, yeah, I made a radical decision. Everybody almost to a T used the words, that's crazy, uh, but left it all behind. Cause you know, just people say, oh, well, yeah, you take a gap year when you're 18 or 22 or whatever, you go see the world. And then you sort of, you know, do what you're supposed to do. Most people don't do that when they're in the early thirties on, on the trajectory you want to be on for your career, but it changed my life completely. Um, like I said, I had dreamed about seeing places and animals and cultures around the world. And here I was for a year backpacking around the world and seeing it and doing it and experiencing it. And uh, it set my life on a really spectacular trajectory, actually, because it was when I came back from that, that I wrote The Cafe on the Edge of the World, which then led to The Big Five for Life and all the rest of it. So had I had not taken the leap into the void, which is one of the toughest things often in life, I wouldn't be who I am today. That's amazing. Thank you. We're here with John Strzelecki. I'm Dory Clark. This is Better, our weekly Newsweek interview show. We want to say hi to some of the great friends tuning in from around the world. Uh, if you're just joining, type into the chat box. Let us know who you are and where you're dialing in from. We have great friends like Carolyn, who's joining from Cary, North Carolina. Beth is in London. Annette's in Solana Beach. Allison's in Toronto. Anna's in New Hampshire. Kurt is uh, is tuning in. Uh, he's impressed. He says, 8 million copies. I sold 800. <laughs> well, your book is great, Kurt, so mazel to you. Uh, we've got Peter from Edinburgh. We have Patricia joining from Boston. We've got Paulina in Cleveland. Jai is in Delhi. Uh, we've got a LinkedIn friend from Portugal. Dawit is in Ethiopia. Kathy is in St. Louis. Kate's at Duke University. And Cynthia's in Hollywood. We love having every single one of you. Let us know who you are, where you're dialing in from, and your questions for John Strzelecki. Now, John, just in a logistical sense, for somebody who might be considering something like what what you are, you know, what what you have done uh, in the past, where you just you know took took the the year off, you were traveling all around the world. How did you actually pull this off? Was this you know you saved like a maniac for years beforehand, or you know what what would be the the thinking for someone who's like, okay, I totally want to do it. How do you yeah. actually pull it off? You know, it's funny, Dory, before I left, I thought to myself, this is probably going to cost me a lot of money and I will be paying this back for the rest of my life, but I don't care because again, I was at that point where I just felt like that was missing something, something significant was missing from my life. The fascinating thing is that the world is actually quite inexpensive. Having traveled only in the US primarily prior to that, 
my budget expectations were radically different than the reality out there. Um, the trip was less than $40 a day uh, to go travel around the world, uh, Central America, Africa, Southeast Asia are incredibly inexpensive and yet spectacularly beautiful. The people are amazing. The food is incredible. And so it was a big aha to me. This again goes into that stepping into the void. You don't know what you don't know. Um, but if you step into the void a little bit, then you start to see, oh, this reality is a bit different than I was expecting. Um, as a just pure travel tip, I will say for anyone out there who's thinking, I think I would love to do this, pick up a copy of Lonely Planet. It's a series of books and they sell them by the country that you want to go to. And reading through that five minutes a day, every night before you go to bed, will be a fantastic kickstart to uh, get you out there backpacking the world. I love that. That can be a very inspirational uh, source of uh, just sparking some ideas. So that's great. We're here with John Strelecki. Yeah. He is the author of a number of best-selling books. One is called The Cafe on the Edge of the World. And we're here about talking about how do you find your meaning in, in work and in your life? Uh, if, if you're just joining, hit you know hit us up. Uh, type into the chat box and let us know who you are and where you're dialing in from. And if you're enjoying the conversation, hit the like and share button so that your friends can benefit from it as well. Now, John, your books have a very particular niche, a sort of particular slant to them, which is that they are, they are, um, I, I guess you could, you could call them, this is probably wrong language, so you can correct me, but I would call them maybe business fables, where they are stories that you are telling. This is not a nonfiction, do this, do this, do this. These are stories that you are telling, and they have a sort of inspirational message, not just about how we conduct our business, but also about how we conduct our lives. And I'd love to hear a little bit about how you think about this. I mean, for somebody who might be in the place where they are struggling, you know, they're, they're, they're going to work, they're doing their yeah. thing, they're feeling their way, but they might not feel very engaged. They might not actually particularly feel like, oh yes, I am living out my purpose in the world. How do yeah. you begin to tap back into that and into those feelings? Yeah. So first of all, your assessment is is real close to spot on. Certainly the big five for life book is set in, in the context of leadership because it's a story of a 55 year old man uh, who runs these amazing companies. His people love them. Uh, his people love him. They love the way that he leads. And you learn in the opening pages that he's dying. And so over the course of 249 pages, you come to love this man and everything he stands for. And then he dies. And I wrote it that way. There was actually three leaders that I was thinking of when I was writing that book. And I was asking myself the question is, what would the greatest leader in the world look like in terms of the, the day in, the day out? And uh, what's fascinating is that particular book, although it's set in the context of leadership, I've had many, many, many thousands of people tell me that they love that book and they have nothing to do with leadership. And the cafe on the world, on the edge of the world, which really has is not set in the context of leadership. I've had many companies where they are distributed to all their employees. So it's it's been a funny and interesting connection. But the, the overarching theme that I find is that it's people who have a desire to live a life that is more purposeful. And so they do. They want to wake up in the morning on a Monday and be excited about whatever they're working on. Uh, and, you know, I'm a huge right brain, left brain guy. So I'm very creative in the way that I create my stories and the characters and the stories that I tell. But I'm also very left brain in the way that I approach life. And so when I look at the minutes of the, the week, 70% of your awake life Monday through Friday is either getting to work, thinking about work or working. And so if you can find a way to tweak the model so that you actually are excited about what you're doing and it's part of what I call your big five for life, well, now you're getting paid to live the life that you want to be living. And so a question I'm constantly asking myself and I encourage other people to ask themselves is, who is living your dream life? Because there's probably at least one and probably a thousand people out there who are living some version of your dream life, whether it's flexibility in the work hours, the type of work that you do, the type of salary you get paid, the type of people you interact with. There's a lots of different variables, but somebody out there is doing it. It might as well be you. I love that, John. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, if somebody's living your dream life, might as well be you. That's exactly not, right. Yeah, but I think, and I think that it, it addresses a point that I struggled with for a long time, both in my career and in my personal life, which is you have to be willing to accept that it's okay that you're worthy of that. That okay, during my statistically twenty eight thousand nine hundred days on the planet, and by the way, if you really want to freak yourself out, take your age, multiply by three sixty five, subtract from twenty eight thousand nine hundred. Statistically, that's how many days you have left on the planet. That will be a big like okay, I'm going to do something significant in terms of changing my life in the way that I want it to go. Uh, but why not? You know, why, why not be the one who takes that step? Life is better when you're waking up again on a Monday morning and you're excited about what you're doing. So why not? 
Amen. And it, 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 it embrace it. Like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to let myself be happy. I'm willing to let myself do a job that I'm excited about. It's a personal choice. And uh, let me tell you, as someone who struggled on the other side of that for decades before I made that choice, it's a lot more fun on this side of it. And uh, why not? Yeah, that's that's fantastic. We're here with John Strelecki. He's the author of a number of books. One is The Cafe on the Edge of the World. Another is The Big Five for Life. You can follow him on Instagram. Just go to at John Strelecki. I'm Dory Clark. This is Better, the Newsweek weekly interview show. If you want to make sure you never miss one of our weekly interviews, uh, just go to doryclark.com. You can sign up, get a free self-assessment, and you'll be added to the email list and get reminders about conversations such as these. And some great questions are coming in. Please, uh, Bring, keep bringing them here. We've got friends tuning in. Camelia is from Indonesia. Maureen is from coastal New Jersey. We've got Lynn in the house. Cheryl is uh, here from Minnesota. And Annette had a great question, John, that I'd like to put forward. She wants to know, what sparked insights for you in your travels? Can you give some examples or share a story or an aha of something that you learned from this time that you spent on the road? Wow. Uh, that would be about... 42 hours worth of content and I would love to share that. So I'll just give you a couple of highlights, but yeah, awesome question. It was literally on a daily basis that something would happen. And to that point, one of the things that really hit me was just how precious a day is because earlier in my career, when I was in my probably mid twenties or so, uh, I was so looking forward to Friday that when I showed up on a Monday morning, I literally wished that I had the ability to fast forward to Friday at five o'clock and start, start the week there. And then when you're out on the road and you're traveling and you realize how spectacular a day can be, right? A day seeing the Great Wall of China, uh, walking along the far remote reaches that are pretty much undeveloped, untapped. A day in Africa where you get to sit and watch animals, something I dreamed of since I was a little boy. And it's, it's one thing to read it in a book. It's another thing to watch it on a Discovery Channel. But when you're right there and there is, you're looking outside of the car window up at the belly of a giraffe that is walking next to you, it's just transformative. It's life-changing. And so I think that's it is when you're out there in a way that is so tied to who you dreamed of being at some point in your life, it just shifts your perspective forever. I was very fortunate that I did it in my early 30s because it is it has changed the trajectory of my decision making. You know, again, first of all, I realized that you could travel the world quite inexpensively. I didn't have to have the mass amount of budget that I thought was necessary. Second of all, I'm not willing to sacrifice a day like I was before. That's very, very powerful. And third of all, it makes you incredibly grateful uh, when you're traveling in third world countries, especially. I remember being in Vietnam and there's many bands, these outdoor bands, and they play different musical instruments. And when you take just a second and look closer, you realize that many, many of those band members are missing a limb, right? They've lost a hand or a leg in a landmine. Um, you're in Indonesia and you're interacting. I remember this one little girl, eight years old, that was carving pineapples, like the speed of light, this kid with this giant knife was carving pineapples and offering from sale and taking the money. Like this kid is like an entrepreneur of all entrepreneurs. At eight years old, she's standing outside of a temple in Indonesia. And it just reinforced for me just how lucky I am that I get a US passport, a Western passport. I did nothing to deserve that. Absolutely nothing to deserve these opportunities. And so shame on me, first of all, if I don't take advantage of the fact that I've gotten this gift to go see this amazing planet. And then for me personally, shame on me also, if I don't do something to try and help make a difference in the life of someone else to give them that opportunity. Yeah, that's terrific. We're here with author John Strelecki. He's the author of a number of books. One is Cafe on the Edge of the World. Another is The Big Five for Life. And we're talking about how to tap into meaning and purpose in our work. And some great questions are coming in. One came in, John, from Anna. And she's curious, the, the first step is really finding one's inner pursuit, you know, one's, one's inner purpose. And how yeah. do you do that? Wait, this seems like very amorphous, right? How do you even go about something like that? What advice would you give for someone who is starting that journey or is just not quite sure what, what initial steps that you should be taking? Okay, so this again is a long conversation, but I'll shrink it down to just a couple of quick tips. And that is uh, the first one I wanna do is uh, commend you for even asking the question. To me, that was the first step in my journey. Um, the very first question in the cafe book on the menu is why are you here? And that's a question that I was asking myself from as long as I could remember. And it's very useful to allow ourselves to ask that question in a quiet environment, no distractions, turn off the phone, you know, turn off anything that is going to be pulling your brain away from that very question. And then go for a walk in the woods, go for a walk along the beach, something in nature and ask yourself that question. Huh, why am I here? 
And if we allow ourselves to ask that question two, three, 10 days in a row without expectation about what's going to come, without feeling the pressure of, I have to know the answer right now, it is amazing what will come forth from the unconscious mind. And the great news about that is that in all the years, all the people that I've had the great pleasure of working with to help them discover their personal big five for life, I've never met a person yet, Dory, that didn't already have it inside of them. My job was to simply peel back the layers of you have to do this, you should do this, you can't do this to allow that to come forth. And so whether it's the exact person who asked the question or anyone else who's, who's listening or watching on this, know that it's in you already. And the trick is to allow it to come forth. Another tactical thing you can do is a very specific little thing is ask yourself, what do you love to do when you don't have to do other stuff? So, you know, on the weekends, oh, you can't wait for the weekend to get there because you get to go kayaking or you get to go ballroom dancing or you get to go like what is the thing that is the thing you love to do when you don't have all these other things that are sort of keeping you from that thing and then ask yourself a couple of really simple questions well, who's already doing those types of things when i do them on the weekend like who's teaching that class or if your expertise is marketing who's the marketing person for that class who's the scheduling the event person who's the you can get your this is the very simple example that i like to, to use is listen if you love kayaking and your expertise is accounting at least get a job as an accountant in a kayaking company. And I know that sounds so ridiculously simple, but almost my entire life until it came to me, nobody ever explained that to me. I don't know how that isn't like part of our everyday wisdom. That should be part of high school, your first job when you're getting your first job, but it's not. And so know that that's possible. You might as well do that. Amen to that. Yeah, no, no reason that we can't. And so you were alluding to this, Sean. I wanna, I wanna uh, sort of lean into this a little bit more. Your book, Big Five for Life. Now, those of us who have been lucky enough to go, go to Africa, go on safari, we know what the Big Five are. The Big Five are the animals that everybody wants to see when you're on safari. But yeah. you mean something different by this. And so when you have the, your book, The Big Five for Life. What are you talking about? And can you sort of explain the concept to people? Yeah, I mean, the idea comes from the African Big Five. That's where I had the big aha moment uh, was in seeing the animals of Africa, which again was something that I had dreamed of since I was a little, little boy. And what struck me after I came back from the experience was, so people gauge the success of their safari experience. If they see three of the African Big Five, it's okay. Four, it's even better. Five, it's like Nirvana. It was like exactly what I came to Africa for. And so what stayed with me from that was what if we were to approach our lives in a similar fashion? What if we were to allow ourselves to identify the five things that we most want to do, see, or experience in our lifetime before we die? And then we were to align our resources, our time, our energy, our financial resources, all of those things towards those big five for life so that at the end of our life, no matter when that is, we could look back and you say, well, no matter what else I did or I didn't get to, I got to the things that mattered most to me. And again, this is something that ideally we would be getting when we're very, very young and structuring our lives in this fashion. It, it didn't happen that way for me. It doesn't seem to happen that way for hardly anyone. And so although it's a simple concept, the application of the concept I've found to be very life changing in my own life and very life changing for others. Yeah, I love that. That's great. We're here with John Strelecki. He's the author of uh, multiple best-selling books. I'm Dory Clark. This is Better, the Newsweek weekly interview show. If you're enjoying the conversation, hit the like button and share button and type your questions for John Strelecki into the chat box. We would love to have them. We have lots of great people tuning in like Gail from North Carolina. Hi, Gail. <laughs> We're both very glad to see you. Now, John, something I wanted to ask you about, I know that as it happens, this month you are doing a sort of special promotion on Instagram. And yeah. I want to hear about this. This sounds pretty good. John funds your dream. Uh, this is your Instagram where people can uh, can learn a little bit more. But can you explain this concept? What the heck are you doing? Yeah. So every year I have an exercise that I go through, which is a process of identifying what would make this year the best year ever. It's something that I do individually. It's something that each member of my family does. And then we sort of pool. It's something that my team and I do. And so when we are asking ourselves for 2023, what could we do to help make this the best year ever and to celebrate the amazing fans that we have, we came up with this campaign. So John Fun, F-U-N-D-S. So John funds your dream. Play on words with the fun part because the goal is to have it be fun. And also the funds because uh, every 21 days, we're going to pick one of the followers of our channel, our Instagram channel at John Strelecki. And we are going to contribute uh, up to 1,000 euro or $1,000 if you're in the States 
towards your dream. And so if your dream is to go shark cage diving in South Africa and you're the one who's picked, well, guess what? We're going to help you get there and experience that. If you always dreamed of eating at a five-star restaurant, that's like something you cannot wait. You're thinking about it, dreaming about it, salivating over it, uh, and you get picked, then we're going to fund that. And so the goal is just to create an opportunity for goodness, for laughter, for fun, uh, and to get that taste of the life that you're dreaming of. Because what I discovered in my travel story is that when we allow ourselves to just touch greatness as it relates to whatever is greatness for us, again, whether it's traveling the world, taking a dance class, shark diving, whatever. But when you allow yourself to touch that piece of existence that you so want to, it is unbelievably inspiring to make that more of your life. And so this big campaign, the whole goal of it is to allow people to touch that part of themselves that they always want to, to experience something amazing so that they can have more of that in their life. That sounds great. And so people can learn more and get uh, get in the pipeline for being considered for this at uh, just follow you on Instagram. It's at John Strelecki. Uh, so thank Absolutely. You. All, the, all the details, all the instructions are there. And every 21 days, we're going to pick someone. And uh, so it's going to be super fun. That's amazing. That's right. So, so, you know, watch out, Gail, you might get to go shark cage diving. So <laughs> this is going to be, this is going to be very good. Uh, excellent. So John, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, you know, your, your books have been very successful. They've literally sold millions of copies around the world. They're very popular, um, you know, not just in the U S but globally, which is really cool. Can you share some of the most important lessons that you've found about book marketing? Um, you know, most, yeah. uh, you know, almost anybody who has published a book or who knows an author uh, is aware it is not easy to get people to buy books, especially nowadays. The idea of somebody, you know, okay, paying 20 bucks or whatever it is for a thing when, uh, you know, it's so much easier to spend $10 a month to watch yeah. every single thing on Netflix. That's hard. <laughs> Convincing someone to spend anywhere from three to 10 hours reading your book is very hard in a uh, distraction plagued culture. So this is a bit of an uphill battle. So to sell this many copies of a book, it requires something a little bit special F for somebody who might be thinking of writing a book or maybe who has a book out, but it hasn't sold 8 million copies, which is most authors. Um, what would be your top uh, piece of advice or a couple of pieces of advice that you might share? Sure. I, you know, the first thing is always uh, don't let it intimidate you. And so if you were to walk into Book Expo America or the Frankfurt Book Fair in Europe, which is one of the biggest book fairs there, and you see the half million titles that are just being released this six months, let alone the next six months, it's so easy to just say, how in the world is anyone going to find my little book? I just won't do it. And I would strongly encourage you to not let that overtake you because if there is something inside of you that says this is a book and this is waiting to happen, then there's a reason that it's supposed to happen. And maybe it's going to change the life of one person. Maybe it's going to change the life of millions. But there is a reason that that is part of your story. And so I really encourage you to embrace that. I will tell you from a process perspective that I always write from the heart. I think if I write something that makes me laugh, it's probably going to make somebody else laugh. If it makes me cry, it'll make somebody else cry. And so the more authentic you can be in your writing, that's going to come through in the reader experience, which is what it's all about. From a very, very tactical, but this has been one of the most effective things I've done is when I get finished with a book, I will, and I, I'm, I'm very tactical in the way that I write. So I write 10 pages a day. I get up in the morning, I write 10 pages a day until the book is done. I typically know ahead of time how many pages I want it to be. So I know, okay, 250 pages is going to be a 25 day experience for me. I don't start with emails. I don't start with my phone. I start with my 10 pages. So I get that done. When I have gone through the entire writing process and I really, and then I've edited and I edit fanatically, like I will go through 50 times until I feel every single sentence, every single word is exactly what I want it to be. When I feel it's done, done, I ask 10 people to be my very critical focus group. And I tell them, I don't want to hear, I liked it. I don't want to hear, it was great. What I want to hear is you lost me at this point. If I lost you at some points, if you got bored at this point, if you absolutely were brought to tears because you loved it at some point, I definitely do want to hear that. But I want really genuine critical feedback because the toughest thing about releasing a book is you only get one shot at it. You can't tell everybody, oh, by the way, I changed that part. I never really liked it anyway. And so here it is now. Uh, so be willing to put yourself in the fire and let your potential readers give you feedback. Because at the end of the day, that's who it's all about is the reader. It's not, I mean, you got to love it because you're going to be out there promoting it. My guess is that's already there. You wouldn't start writing it. So make sure that your critical feedback 
is implemented in your decision making about what to keep, what to cut and what to change. Um, and then the last thing I would say is you just got to be out there all the time, Dory. Like if you truly love your subject matter, if you truly love your book, then allow yourself to be out there. And I remember when I first started, I thought the book came through me over the course of 21 days. It was a stream of conscious typing experience after I came back from traveling around the world. One of the most beautiful organic experiences ever. But the struggle for me was I thought, who am I to stand on a stage and talk about this? Who am I to do an interview? I'm just me. I'd like a shorts and a t-shirt kind of guy wears a hat when he goes backpacking around the world. But what I learned is that the question is not who am I to? The question for each of us is who are you not to? Like Everybody has something special to offer. Everybody has genius within them. And if it wants to come out, there is a reason that it's supposed to come out. That's really powerful. Thank you. We're here with John Strelecki. You can follow him on Instagram at John Strelecki. I'm Dory Clark. This is our weekly Newsweek interview show. Better if you want to get reminders about such things, you can follow me on LinkedIn. Just go to doryclark.com slash li. You can uh, sign up, subscribe, and uh, get notifications. Now, John, a great question came in as a follow-on to the point that you were making about the big five for life, five top goals that somebody has for themselves. And Cheryl was curious, have you ever been surprised by how small something on a person's big five list is? Sometimes, sometimes small things are pretty significant to that person. Uh, I'm, cool. I'm just curious, you've probably heard, uh, having written this book and talked about this concept, you've probably heard a lot of people's uh, you know, big five. What are some patterns that you hear or what has been surprising for you? Yeah, I, travel is a very common one on people's list. And so again, had I have succumbed to the perceived awareness I had about how expensive travel was based on my own small life experiences, it probably would have kept me from going. And so that can open up your vista based on the previous topics we've covered as it related to travel. And you're 100% right. Uh, and the person who asked this question is 100% right that at the end of the day, it only matters to you. You know, the, it, it, well, it doesn't really, ca who cares whether it seems small to someone else. It's your big five for life list. And so, so the most precious moments in my life are the times that I've spent with my daughter. And when she was little, uh, about two years old, I made the decision that twice a, twice a week, so every Tuesday and Thursday, we would do adventure days. And that she was only two years old and I would pack up the, the diaper bag and the stroller and the snack bag and off we would go and we'd go to the park and we'd play ice cream cone and we'd go on the slides, anything within two hours of my house over the course of the years as she grew up. Now, that's not going to win you any awards. That's not going to show up in a data line of your bio in terms of how many millions of copies books sold, nothing. But that means more to me than anything else in the world. And so at the end of the day, it's really about just being authentic and true to yourself that this is important to you. You stay with that one and you'll be great. I love that. That's fantastic. John, we have time for probably just one more question. And one of the themes that I wanted to talk about is uh, something that I know is one of the more popular concepts from your book, uh, The Big Five for Life. You talk about something uh, called the Museum Day. Can you explain yeah. what that is and, and what that means? Yeah. So Museum Day is a concept that came to me. I was walking through a tiny little museum uh, kind of near where I live in a place called Winter Garden, Florida, actually. And it's a tiny little two-room museum. Uh, it's not a whole ton of stuff there. It's a cute little, cool little museum. But there was all these pictures of people from the early 1900s. It was a high school yearbook. And I was looking through it. And I thought to myself in that moment, I wonder if they did it. You know, like here they are at 17, 18 in the early 1900s. They're all passed away by now. Did they do it? Did they ask out that person they always dreamed of asking out? Did they go on the big adventure they always dreamed of going on? You know, what did their life turn out to be? And that that thought sparked a question in my head of like, imagine if our lives were recorded, everything we did, everything we said, all the places that we went. And then towards the end of our life, a museum is built to honor us, except that museum is going to show our life exactly how we lived it. And so when you think about that and you think about your own life and you think about the wings of the, the museums that you want to, the wings in the museum that you want to create, it's a wonderful way to ask ourselves, is the steps I'm taking today getting me one step closer to where I want to be tomorrow? Is the life that I'm creating this second enabling me to fill my museum with wonderful things I would love to live, not just today, but literally for all of eternity? It's, so it's just a cool way to connect people to a little bit bigger perspective on life. That's so terrific. Thank you very much. We have been here with John Strelecki. He's the author of The Cafe on the Edge of the World, The Big Five for Life, and numerous other books. You can follow him on Instagram at John Strelecki. And uh, by doing so, you can uh, get the specs and it can potentially make you eligible for John 
funds your dream, which is uh, which is very cool. Uh, thank you to everyone who has joined us today. I'm Dory Clark. This is Better, the Newsweek Weekly interview show every Thursday. And John Strelecki, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Dory. It's been a, been a pleasure, been a treat. Thank you so much and see you all next week.